Hello and welcome to Warren College's How to Parent Your College Student 101. My name is Michelle Mukhlian. I use pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm the executive assistant to our Dean of Student Affairs. Next slide, please. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and run through our um, agenda for today's program. First, we're gonna be going over how to best commun communicate with your students. Next, we'll be talking about the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, otherwise known as FERPA. Then we'll transition into what our student conduct process looks like. And finally, we're gonna be ending with how to support your students' social and emotional well-being, along with a Q&A session. To kick off our program today, I'd like it I'd like to pass it on to our Director of Residence Life, Dana Pidge. Thank you, Michelle. Hey, everybody. Happy Wednesday to you on this 13th day of September. Uh, use my radio voice. I used to be a radio DJ back in the day. My name is Dana Pidge. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I've been here just over seven years at UC San Diego and Warren College. Excited uh, about our students moving in um, starting next week. Uh, early move-in, and then the following in two weekends, we have our uh, our actual move-in weekend. So um, things I want to share with you uh, is this acknowledgement that, uh, you know, many of you have your student, if this is your first student going away to school, going away to college, um, knowing that one moment they're under your roof and your rules, and then the next minute you drop them off the school and they are start adulting and your ability to control or understand see them change uh, starts to separate. So this idea of giving your students space to grow is very critical. Um, and it's how do you um, parent differently? And, and so it's not my job to, to teach you how to parent because you've done a great job raising them where they are now. It's more of how do you adjust your parenting um, as they start to start into adulthood and independence and college life and all. Um, so uh, I see often, um, you know, questions that I might get from parents of like, Hey, do uh, do they have a curfew? No, they, they don't. They're an adult. They can stay up all night and um, they can not go to class and they could um, play games all day. That's not what we want them to do, but they, they can be an adult and all. So um, I, we, we don't have curfews and all. But um, I, I do want to talk about how to stay in touch with your student and having a new type of communication with them in a relationship with them. So next slide, please, around helping your student, giving your students some space to grow. So this is a little bit about some do's and don'ts about communicating with your students. Um, I know you call them your son or daughter or your child. Uh, we call them your students on here. Um, but it's uh, the, the top box of there about, well, it's important to talk to your student and check in on them. It's also important to let, let them live their lives now they're away from home. You might have been used to talking to them every single day, um, multiple times in the day via text or via phone or in person. Um, that may change. And um, and this is this might be a little uh, unsettling for you, uncomfortable. Um, and then you wonder, like, are they OK? Um, and, you know, rest assured that they're OK. They're they're just living their their student life here and, and all. So some do's and don'ts here. I'll start with the don'ts on there. You know, don't call them every day or text them every day unless they agree to that. So this is actually having a good conversation with them at the front end. And that this could change as well because they might say, um, I don't want you to call me every day. And then they say they do or they say they do call them every day and then they change that. So this is just having an open conversation like, hey, now they're in college. How often you know, do you want me to reach out or vice versa? Don't try to constantly message them. You might have one mode of, of messaging them, which might be text or calling them. They use many other uh, avenues with their friends and family. They might use Snapchat or Instagram or Discord to communicate with each other. Um, if you don't know what those platforms are, your students do, and they use them pretty, pretty, pretty frequently. You might find that using one of those platforms is a way to better communicate with them or they respond to you. So uh, again, having an open conversation with them is important. If they, if they if you live nearby, um, it's probably not the best to pressure them to come home every weekend um, because they, they're trying to live their life and learn how to be an adult and independent here. Um, there is naturally some homesickness, so you have to also support them of like, hey, are you getting involved and all? 
Uh, have you met any friends? Have you gone to any programs? So that's a good way to help encourage them. On the do side of things of communicating with your student, ask them what works best for them in terms of the communicating. I kind of mentioned that a little bit, but um, I'll give you the example that happens very often is that you uh, you have not solidified sort of how you're communicating with them. Um, you haven't heard them for them. You haven't heard from them the whole day, and now you're worried about them. Well, we have a full full fledged police department on campus, and if uh, one of my colleagues can put the UCPD's number in the in the um, chat, um, that would be helpful for you to put in your phone. But they are able to che check on your student, but they only do it if there's a crisis situation. It's not, oh, I haven't heard from them from an hour in, or half a day. Uh, this is you coming up with a plan of how to communicate um, if you need to tell them something important or vice versa. Because it is awkward for a student to have UCPD come knock on their door, uh, an officer or two, and say, oh, your mom's been trying to get a hold of you and it's been three hours. Um, it's embarrassing for them. I've been with a student before. Uh, they have their roommates there, their suite mates. And so we really want to save the checking in on them with UCPD when there's a real true emergency, not you haven't heard from. Them. Now, it's been a few days and you're really concerned. Definitely, that would be a wise course to use them. But let's think about their perception. And, um, you know, oftentimes students go to sleep or their um, or their phone's dead or they turn off their phone. They're sleeping in the middle of the day because they stayed up all night. These things are natural parts of students' lives and adjusting um, and you being able to uh, understand that they may be living their life differently than how they did at home. Another do on there, which is set up a time to talk with them. When I was in school before cell phones, I told my parents I'd call them every Sunday night before 8 p.m. or whatever. So that's what I did. And I called them once a week. And that was my plan. And I and if I um, and I don't think I missed it. Can't remember. It's been quite a few years. Um, and maybe you need to talk with them more often than that. So uh, ask them if they're okay with that. They might say, mom, that's a little too much, or dad, that's a little too much. Can we do it every other day or a few times a week? Uh, maybe you want to see their face. And so FaceTiming them might be a way to do it uh, on there, but ask them what works for them. And then in your own parental style, remind them that, that you're there if they want to talk to you about anything. Again, they could be homesick and you could just ask them direct questions like, hey, have you been making any friends? Ask them their friends' names or some interests of their friends. Had they been getting involved with any organizations or groups or attending any programs on there? You can ask them directly, have you been feeling homesick? Um, you know, you just can be there to listen. It's sort of, sort of the best part because you have an 18-year-plus relationship with your, with your son or daughter. And just letting them know that you're there to talk anytime uh, is important for them. So that's a little bit about communicating. We, uh, Michelle didn't mention, but we do have a community a Q and A function that you're able to ask questions. Um, that there's teams be behind the scenes that can help answer them or will answer questions live. But I'm going to go on to the next slide and talk a little bit about just um, your your student being an adult and the what the Feder Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, which we call FERPA, talks about. It's a whole bunch of stuff on there, but that bottom line is that we consider students, the university considers a student adult, even if they're 17 or 16, they matriculate to the university and they have certain rights of privacy that the federal government protects them on there. So the bottom line, which is at the bottom there is that you cannot access your student's educational record without their written consent. The educational record can be around their classes, their grades, their conduct issues, um, Anything at the university on here that we have to get written consent from the student to give you or anybody else that they give us permission to talk to them about. So I can talk generally about what we do in situations, but um, and you could tell me information, but I can't tell you information that, oh, your uh, son or daughter is in this room or um, that they even go here because some students, unfortunately, don't have the best relationship with their parents or their family members and want that freedom and privacy from them, and they have that right per this per, per FERPA and the federal government law on here. So we try to be respectful of that. We know that's not the case for most students. They have a good relationship with their parents. But um, if, you, if you feel like your student's not being honest with you about their grades or if they're enrolled, um, they have to give us permission for us to have uh, a conversation with, with you about those specific items on there. And we would walk you through that. Um, that would be any office here on campus um, that if you want to know some, some specific information um, and the educational records are all encompassing of everything I talked about there, 
financial record, their um, they own a bill, owe a bill, or their housing bill, classes, conduct, like things I said on there. So just to like to share that up front, um, because it is a little difficult for parents sometimes when they're like, oh my goodness, I just, they're, I'm paying for their school. Yes, you might be, um, but they, they still own the right to all their information. So that, that's important for you to know. So that's a little bit about FERPA. I'm not going to pass it on to my colleague, Sinisa, and she's going to share some other information for you to hopefully be a um, successful parent as your student transitions. So, Sinisa. Uh, uh, hello, all. I'm Sinisa Thomas, pronoun she's and hers. I'm the student care and accountability specialist at Warren. Um, the student care and accountability specialist, also pronounced SCOS. Uh, we try to use a lot of acronyms here to cut down on speaking. Um, so you can also call us the SCOS. Um, our position was a new role to the student care team created within the colleges. Um, and it was currently added to the teams within fall 2021 to support the growth needs and well being of students and also to contribute to the collective work of creating a culture of care. Um, currently, our position exists also at Mira, Seventh, Ravel, Marshall, and ERC. Um, so the remaining colleges may also add the position at a later future um, date. But for now, um, across the colleges, our positions are within those specific ones. And if there's any additional outreach that needs to be done, we do so case by case. Um, we work alongside the Dean of Student Affairs, Academic Advisors, Res Life, as well as CAPS, Case Management, and any other department connected to the colleges. Next slide. So although we try to connect with the students as much as possible, I'm sure you all are a little bit more experienced in noticing some of the certain signs of distress um, that happen personally within students. So um, we ask that you all help us to support your students' social and emotional well-being from afar whenever you see or talk to them. Today we'll be going over what signs to look for, how to do so, and what resources are at the student's disposal in case of emergencies. Next slide. So before I jump into the signs to look for, just a quick piece on student belonging. Um, a big part of student retention and student support services here at UCSD is student belonging. Belonging is just one of the needs that we need to ensure that students are enriched with during their time at UC San Diego. A student's sense of belonging can really shape their mindset and approach to their transition, as well as how they approach any upcoming adversities throughout their college journey. So we really try to make sure that they're well supported and that they are listened to while they're here on campus. And if there's any students that are struggling in their approach to belonging that we try to help them out as much as possible. Next slide. So diving more into student belonging, these are just a few of the three pillars that really foster student sense of belonging. That is interpersonal relationships, identity exploration, and mindset. So I'll be going over these three briefly just to give you a bit of insight into how we approach um, fostering their sense of belonging while they're on campus. The first piece is interpersonal relationship. That speaks to how much a student is involved in their campus community, their ability to form strong relationships and connections with their peers, faculty, and staff. Um, usually without having a strong network of relationships, we find that students on campus might start to feel excluded or isolated and left out. Um, these feelings can really lead to an increase in not feeling supported or cared about. Um, and those feelings can really start to um, internalize within the student and affect some of the other core pieces of their student identity, such as academics, um, or even just their, their um, process of communication and forming other connections throughout their time. Um, sometimes it can also fill them to feel as if maybe they don't belong here. Um, and maybe the college journey is just not for them. The next piece is identity exploration. This is how well a student is seeking to form their own sense of identity. This pillar is really about students seeking out opportunities that expand their knowledge of self or learning about themselves through others. Um, whenever this pillar is really strong, you notice that students are a little bit more attuned with themselves and what their needs are. Um, and they're also a little bit more likely to stick to strong sets of core values, morals, ethics, and that can really help them become more resilient and make better decisions. 
The last pillar is mindset. And mindset really speaks to what we want students to foster, which is called a growth mindset. Um, and that is when student is a little bit more focused on learning rather than how much they can prove their ability to others that they are learning. Um, they're a little bit more open to the concept that the nature of intelligence is not fixed whenever they face difficulties. And they're more likely to seek out challenges that lead to socially and academically engaging opportunities. Um, all of this combined together can really enhance their motivation um, and their perseverance when it comes to performance, both academically as well as social connection forming. So again, this really just improves the student's determination, resilience, and perseverance, even within high stress environments, um, which can happen at UCSD or even after unexpected failures. Next slide. So sometimes with students who might be lacking one of the above pillars, um, or even with students who might be going through unexpected life crises, um, we might see them become what we call at UCSD a student of concern. This is a student whose academic progress or functioning in the university environment is adversely affected due to a number of indicators, which we'll outline in the next few slides. And these indicators might impact their well being or the well being of others around them. Next slide. So these are just a few of the indicators of concern. Um, they spread across physical, behavioral, psychological, as well as unmet basic needs. Um, these indicators might show that a student is in jeopardy with their academic performance or emotional well being, or might just need any additional support in one of these key areas. If you notice that your student is experiencing any number one of these indicators, we encourage you to ask them more questions about how things are going um, and also to ask them to find a support person to check in with on campus so that we can check in with them as well. Um, I'll go over this a little bit more in a bit, but we like to try to push for students to reach out to us on their own rather than having parents reach out to us just because it's a little bit easier to have that communication, especially with FERPA involved, and just by adding another layer of confidentiality and privacy between their resources on campus and the student. Next slide. So like I said, whenever these indicators become more prevalent or intense, um, it might create maybe a unusual set of behaviors, whether they're problematic or whether they are violating student conduct, or maybe if they're just causing a concern in the classroom. Um, if this happens, they may be referred to student and staff, student affairs staff. Um, it might be referred to student affairs staff or by a third party referral, such as faculty member, care, or another staff member. Um, we have a four step process for supporting our SOCs. Step one is a referral, which is done via email, phone, word of mouth, not to be done anonymously via the Try and Concern line. Um, the Try and Concern line has the online form which students can either refer a peer or faculty can refer a student. Um, outside entities can also refer to the Try and Concern line. So that means a family member can also refer to the Try and Concern line. It's just like a reporting process for us so that we can document things and follow up with the student. Um, when that referral is done, based on the circumstances and intensity of the need, we will decide which staff member they should be connected to. Next, we'll go to step two, which is outreach. At that point, the student affairs staff that they're connected to will outreach via phone or email to request for the student to meet with us for a support meeting. Within that meeting, it's a time for us to gain a better understanding of what's going on. Um, and that's where we can begin the process of figuring out what are the appropriate resources that the student might need um, in order to solve whatever scenario is currently going on. Uh, step three is the actual connection process. That's when we connect the student to resources. Um, sometimes that means that we might do an email handoff to another department. Um, sometimes we might ask a staff member to reach out to the student. Um, or we might follow up with paperwork, documentation, things like that. And the last step is four, which is a follow-up. Um, so after we hand off the students with their resources, we'll try to do a follow-up just to see if those resources work well for the student or if they need anything else. Sometimes we might follow up in additional weeks or quarters just to check in 
and see if the problem is still persisting and just to see how they're doing for all this to go. If so, then we'll close out the case. Um, but students are more than welcome to come back to us whenever they need to. So if anything ever comes up again, they're always welcome to reach back out. Um, and yeah, so after we connect with the student, we'll follow up, um, we'll reach out, and we'll document it that the student's doing well. So like I said, although we know that you all are more, more than happy to reach out to us on behalf of your student if they're in need, we also encourage that you help support them in becoming self-advocates. Um, so really ask some questions and encourage them to reach out to us and to contact their resources when you need to. Um, we find that students are more eager and they're more transparent and open to it, seeking and accepting help when they initiate the contact on their own, rather than when they are referred to us by um, a parent or a family member. Next slide. Um, quickly, I'll go over what our student conduct policies look like here on campus. Um, the process for both student conduct, um, for both academic misconduct and non-academic misconduct are pretty much the same. Um, for both, there is a reporting process that's done. Um, when students enter, we briefly go over what the conduct code looks like. Um, there is a conduct code that applies via the campus, and there's also residential life community standards that apply to students when they're living within the residential communities. Um, if any of those standards are broken, whether it's student conduct, residential life community standards, um, or academic integrity, um, a report is created um, with a student. For both academic and non-academic misconduct, um, the process is the same. A report is created. Um, once a report is created, we document it within our systems. Um, we will ask for the student to have a resolution meeting to go over what happened within the case. Um, sanctions are assigned according to what we found out within that resolution meeting. Um, if sanctions are not agreed upon, there might be like an appeal process initiated by the student in which the case will be reviewed again. Um, and from there, they decide on sanctions um, according to a set of guidelines um, within academic integrity conduct and student conduct um, for non academic misconduct. So that's kind of just a brief overview of the conduct process. It's fairly straightforward and simple. Um, and for the most part, the main purpose of conduct is for the students to kind of really learn from their, their mistakes and their decision making. Um, and also just to ensure that they understand how their actions impact both themselves as students, but also our larger campus community as well. Um, so if there's any questions regarding conduct, usually our conduct offices are pretty open and transparent to going over things with students. Um, it's not the first time that a student has gotten in trouble here at UCSD, so um, we have a lot of well-educated and well-informed staff members in place um, to help them through that process if it ever does come up during their time at UCSD. Next slide. Uh, lastly, there are just a list of resources students can reach out to if they're in need of support. There is quite a lot of them, um, and there is still an extensive list even beyond this list that doesn't include um, all of like our ethnic resource centers as well that are also resource um, departments as well. Um, most of these departments are usually available Monday through Friday. I will say that a lot of departments are on a hybrid schedule. So we do recommend that students send outreach if they need help via email or to leave a voicemail if they call, just in case a staff member isn't currently in place at their physical location. Um, if you're noticing that your student needs help, um, like I said, we really encourage you to encourage them to find their own campus community, whether it's participating in the clubs um, or to explore some of the remaining resources. We've also noticed that some students um, are interested in also giving back to campus. So sometimes there's also student employment um, opportunities within these campus resources as well, so that the student can educate themselves a little bit more on what office does, as well as helping to connect other students to that resource. Um, really encourage them to stay in touch with their own well-being and health. 
um, and to tell someone sooner rather than later, the sooner that they reach out to us and the sooner that we can help them, um, the more we can mi minimize um, the impact of whatever the scenario or crisis might have on their academics and their well-being as well. Um, so yeah, like I said, please share these re resources with your students. Um, we will bombard them during orientation with a lot of these resources, again, just to repeat it. Um, but I would also just encourage you all to maybe take a screenshot or just make note of them for your own note-taking purposes um, and just to hold them in the case anything ever comes up. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanisa. Um, now we'd like to hear from all of you. This next portion is going to be our Q&A portion. So please utilize the Q&A function located at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit your questions. Um, you can also submit the questions anonymously. Um, and please make sure to not share any personal information. Uh, we'll be answering most relevant questions live, but we have uh, several staff members who will be answering questions um, directly. Um, so please go ahead and submit your questions. I'll give just a second for those to come in and I will be sharing out the most um, common ones. So a common question that I received is um, about FERPA. Uh, Dana, may, maybe you can take this one. Um, do parents need to send the same form to all different departments, or is there just one blanket form that need to submit that needs to be submitted um, in regards to FERPA? Yeah, the form is specific about which departments you want to have uh, that your student wants you to get access for. There is not a blanket that says any university. So it would be like the Dean of Students Office, financial aid, and you can list that on the form um, and those departments can share that amongst them. But a student may not want to have their parent have access to all those things. So that's why there's not a blanket form on there. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, and while you're, uh, go ahead, sorry, Michelle, I'll cut you off. No, no, go ahead. That was it, that was it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, just monitoring the questions here. It looks like several of them are being answered in the background. Thank you all so much. Um, once again, regarding to uh, in regards to the FERPA form, um, where can parents find that? And if possible, maybe that is that something that we can even drop in the chat for folks. I think we'll, folks will be looking into that and getting an answer to that uh, question real soon. Um, but Dina and Sneesa, I did want to ask you um, to maybe tell us a little bit more about your favorite campus resource for students. First, um, my favorite campus resource, I kind of have two, but one is just overarching um, all of our ethnic resource centers. So um, that's like the Rosa Resource Center, um, the, um, sorry, I'm the that's like all of our ethnic resource centers so that students can experience some of like their cultural programs. A lot of times when there's heritage months, um, those resource centers are included in the formation of those heritage month celebrations. Um, so I've noticed students um, can often find like a really close knit community um, and circle of friends within those resource centers. So I really like that, like I really like those resources. Um, but also our basic needs center, also called the Hub. Um, the Hub does really amazing work as far as providing community resources for students. Um, they really touch upon the students' basic needs, such as food insecurity, housing insecurity, financial financial insecurity. So they provide things such as our train food pantry. Um, they also do CalFresh workshops, which is helping students sign up for SNAP or even food um, assistance. Um, they can also do grocery shuttles. They can also provide, if need be, 
um, like grocery cards if the student um, is struggling to afford um, food for the quarter. Um, they also do housing resources, such as helping the student know a little bit more resources on whenever it is time, finding off-campus housing, um, what their rental rights are. They also do financial wellness. They work hand in hand with the financial aid office. Um, so they can go over things such as like emergency loans or even cost of attendance appeals. Um, but they also do financial literacy workshops, like small things like how to budget or um, how to sign up for your first credit card, what is a credit score, things like that. So they do a lot of work um, across like student community resources. So I really recommend students check out the hub. I would uh, add my one of my favorite resources that um, I encourage students to, to find is their RA, the resident assistant. About 95% of our first years live on campus. Um, most of them, Warren students live in Warren, um, but if they live anywhere else on campus, uh, um, their RA is a, you know, a, a student who's been here for a year or two, has a great knowledge of the campus, it's their peer, to be a mentor, and, you know, really can uh, tailor a need that a student's looking for. There's like 900 or so or student organizations on campus. So plenty of things to get involved or a student can start their own. And then within Warren, we have a half a dozen or so of our own student organizations if they wanna um, get involved within within Warren and SNESA and uh, the student affairs team oversees those. So lots of things locally, right in their own backyard or in their building. Um, it, it's probably a good first place so they don't feel so overwhelmed in the big university. Thank you both so much. Um, I have a question here that I think that uh, would be best for Dana. Dana, will students be required to COVID test in order to get their dorm key? Oh, thanks. Uh, so we are not requiring any COVID testing. Uh, we are encouraging it. Um, so this is uh, through CDC um, and our own state state health. Uh, they will just have to come here. Um, the the uh, UC, UC San Diego is very unique in that we have our own um, testing center and tests available. Um, each college and residential area has a vending machine that has both a rapid test and what we call PCR test is a little more accurate. Um, so once a student is here, they can take a rapid test. Um, they can also take a PCR test and those are all free as part of their, um, you know, as being a student and all. So they're encouraged to, to test, but there is no testing or masking uh, requirements around move in or going to class or, or anything at, the, at this point. Thanks, Dana. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the chat. Um, folks, I highly encourage you to open up the chat here in Zoom because our team has been dropping a lot of great links to things that we've been mentioning, specifically um, FERPA resources, including the actual consent form. So please feel free to check that out. Um, and then I wanted to um, pass it over to Sinisa actually to tell us just a little bit more about different campus safety resources. I know that we've again been dropping things in the chat and we'll continue to do so, but if there's a few things that you wanted to put on folks radar. So I know there was a question regarding campus safety. So um, I'll just do like a brief overview for campus safety. Um, UCSD residential life community standards do prohibit stun guns, uh, knives with a fixed blade, daggers, and shots, tasers. Um, I believe pepper spray within legal amounts might be um, allowed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, one of the stipulations is that um, that can only be discharged under certain, certain circumstances. So if the pepper spray is ever discharged, um, with violent intent um, or with aggression against another student, um, that is when it becomes a violation. Um, if it is used as far as like self-defense on campus, um, things look a little bit different. Like I said, when it comes to um, conduct, um, typically if any incidents do happen on campus, such as an incident that might require pepper spray, um, a hearing will take place to see what the circumstances were um, and just to find out a little bit more as to why the student might have discharged their pepper spray and if it was done within self-defense or if it was done um, as like a first act of depression. So 
Um, all those things are taken into account also when it comes to student hearings um, and when it comes to incidents and violations. Um, otherwise, when it comes to campus safety, um, students, all students are enrolled within UCSD's Triton Alert system. So that's the emergency notification system. It uses phone and email notification. Um, they usually will receive notifications by email, um, text message, um, and possibly voice message. They can update their preferences. Um, but the Triton Alerts are really quick. Um, they are also updating their process for Triton Alerts to make sure that the Triton Alerts come through quickly and that they come through accurately. Um, they also have started to add like all clear um, instructions. So if there's ever an incident on campus, like a shelter in place and students are concerned about, um, oh, can I go into this area? Is it open? Are things safe? Um, they have started to add alerts to tell students that there is an all clear um, and that they can either stop shelter, sheltering in place or whatever area that was closed down is now open. Um, we also have safety escorts that are available through our um, USO programs, the University State Safety Officials. Um, if students feel like they need a safety escort for whatever reason, they can um, call um, their campus phone line and arrange it for the CSO to reach to meet them um, and to walk them back to either their car or their dorm if they feel like that's something that they need. Um, we also provide things like safe rides via lift. Um, sometimes we provide like lift codes as well. Um, and then like on-demand rides with train transit. Um, otherwise, students have access to using CPD, um, USOs. Um, we also have our care center, which is Center for Advocacy, Resources, and Education. Um, and they provide workshops on violence prevention, um, as well as um, a focus on violence for sexual assault, um, relationship violence, and stalking. So um, all of those things in combination are some of just our campus safety emergency contacts. But if they are living on campus, um, they should always make sure to notify um, whoever their RA is to them if something is happening just so that everyone can be looped in. Uh, we do have like a pretty nice um, communication system within the colleges so that when things do happen in the residential halls and RAs are notified, um, residential life staff also get notified. Um, and so we, just so that everybody is looped in um, so that we can make sure that the student gets as much help as possible. Thank you so much for sharing that helpful info, Sunisa. Um, uh, once again, I I've dropped in information about Trident Alerts and the safety escorts into the chat if you'd like to find some more information. Um, Dana, I'm gonna pass it to you. Um, I was actually hoping that you could maybe tell us a little bit more about what safety and patrolling might look like in the residential area. Yep, so I, I do, thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Sunisa, for all the, the, I might repeat some of the resources on there uh, and all. Um, just so uh, everyone is aware, I think you are, that UC San Diego is an open campus. We have no gates or we have multiple entrances in. We have a, a trolley system that comes right onto campus, great for our students to get on and off campus, um, but so can the public. Um, we have stores and a target on campus. So we, we are an open campus that people come and go on here. So with anything uh, in any, and we're a small city basically, you know, teaching your students what it is to be street smart and having that is important on there about locking up their valuables or their bike or their when they're going to class or outside. Um, that uh, on campus in the residential area, we do have our RAs who are on duty in the evening time. So they do patrols. We call them rounds. Um, they're not police officers, they're students here. Um, in addition, the police have a civilian part of their uh, force called University Safety Officers or USOs for short. They do patrols through the whole night through the, through the residential areas. So um, again, they're not police officers, they're civilians, but they work for police department as safety officers, um, being aware of people who shouldn't be there, uh, policy violations um, and other, other safety concerns. And certainly our police force is on campus and they're here 24 seven, 365. So our USOs, uh, University Safety Officers patrol at night from nine p.m. to 5 a.m., um, 365 every single day, even holidays. So, uh, you know, we, we try to create uh, as safe an environment as possible, but, you know, it, it is also uh, 
students making good, safe choices about um, walking together or at, uh, calling UCPD for a, a safety escort, which they're allowed to do if they're coming back late at night from a class. And also, um, we also just one other thing too. Once a year, we do a, a light a lighting walk, meaning at night, uh, campus officials walk the campus with students uh, who want to, and we look at spots that may need to be better lit. Um, always trying to improve our lighting on campus as a way to uh, you know improve safety and um, feeling feeling like uh, students aren't walking in darker spaces and all. So um, our residential area is open. So uh, I often get the question like, oh, can I come and go to visit my son or daughter? Yes, with their knowledge. No one likes to be surprised. Um, so, you know, that might be embarrassing or they're not ready for that. But there's guest parking through transportation services. Um, if you want to look up how to guest park uh, around campus here or take the trolley in. But I always say, if you're going to do a, a pop-in visit, uh, you, you have to get permission to get into the buildings. Um, and that's you're using your, your student uh, meeting you outside to escort you in versus you uh, just going right up to, to their door and all. So I think that was a little bit on the, on the safety and all. And see if there's other questions around that. Uh, I know a lot have been answered in the chat. I'll give it back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Dina. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it looks like we don't have any questions um, here now. Uh, so I'm going to do a last call for some final questions before we wrap up our program today. I'll give folks just a minute to submit those. And while we're waiting, um, if Dana or Sinisa, if you'd like to share what your favorite Warren College tradition is, I'd love to hear it. Well, I'll start since Sinisa went first last time. Um, you know, we do uh, in the residential area some large scale programs. We call them command performances on there. We have a, a signature event per quarter um, in this. Uh, so these were what I would call my traditions that are important to me. But uh, the first Wednesday of um, November is Day of the Dead. Uh, also in Spanish, my Spanish is not so good. So the Day of the Mortis. See, that's why I say Day of the Dead. I know I took French in school. My apologies. <laughs> but that's our uh, program we do for our students. We work with our dining facility, provide um, food and entertainment and activities for them. Um, in uh, winter quarter, we celebrate Lunar New Year with uh, activities and foods. And then in the spring quarter, one of my favorite traditions is also celebrating our college's uh, founder's birthday, uh, Earl Warren, his birthday. Uh, we celebrate that, not his birthday, but uh, thereabouts um, and have a celebration and event for the students and all. So kind of each quarter, a big signature event we call Command Performance so, that we've been doing for many years. So I'll, I'll pass it to Sinisa. We should have gone first because Dana stole mine. <laughs> but um, I think the see even our favorite of, for all of us, also because of the food involved for each of them. Um, so I would say besides the CPs, one of my favorite traditions is actually our student leadership and scholarship celebration. Um, this happens typically within spring quarter, um, and it's just a time for us to recognize our student leaders for their contributions to our foreign college community. It also includes our student employees. Um, we give out end of the year awards as well as any scholarships. Um, we also like to do small little mementos for our seniors who are also graduating at the time. Um, so it's just a nice time for us to give back, of course, for unless you're a student employee, um, you don't get paid to be a student leader. So it's also a nice way for us to just give back and say thank you for all of the work that they put in to plan programs and initiatives for students. Um, it also gets students excited to continue to be involved. So that's also finding the students are looking at how they can continue to be involved in their order or what other orders they might be involved in. Um, and also is a nice combination between our student affairs um, side as well as our academic um, or academic student employees and our res life um, students also included. So like RAs um, as well. So yeah, it's I think a nice time to, for us to give back to the students as staff um, and to appreciate them and to celebrate them. 
Awesome. Thank you both. And I know this question wasn't for me, but I would like to share mine too, um, which is every Wednesday is Warren Wednesday. And it's something so simple, but every Wednesday we encourage students and staff to wear whatever Warren merch they have. And it's just so nice walking around campus and seeing everyone in their different Warren swag. Um, we all have ours on today. Um, but I wanted to throw it back to Dana to actually just give a quick overview of move-in because we received a lot of different questions regarding move-in. So if you could take that away, that'd be awesome. I'll just be brief, but your students have been emailed from our office about move-in procedures. They have their date, their time to move in. Our move-in weekend, our big move-in weekend is the 23rd and 24th. Students can sign up to come in early, as early as the 20th. Um, for early move-in, they would have had already had to sign up for this. It's $50 per night for that to come in early on there. Um, they uh, received instructions in the mail. Um, if you're wondering, all that information is in the link that Belinda posted in the chat. So if you're wondering what they got sent, we, we cut and pasted it exactly into our website so you can see the information. The only thing you can't see is the date and time. Um, the student has to log into their My Housing Portal and, and they will have that. But we will have uh, temporary parking available for them. It will be crowded on Saturday and Sunday. So patience is the key on here um, uh, because we have about 400 moving in each day and uh, limited parking on there. We do have moving carts, but those are a limited number. We have about 50 of them, um, but they get used for about an hour. And so if you have some type of dolly or hand cart to bring, that would be helpful. Um, the student come in, they get their keys. It's a fairly quick process. Um, get, and we have signage up all around the complex and where the buildings are at. Um, we also, in the, in the move-in link, have uh, a map of the complex. So if you're curious where the building is in relation to the dining facility, um, they can eat at any dining facility on campus that's owned by HDH. Their dining dollars work for that. Um, so that they can take, have them take you, to, take you to lunch or dinner. Yeah, test out our food. It's really good. Um, I have a meal plan and enjoy eating there. Um, yeah, and so once they get their keys and move in, uh, they're there to explore and all. Um, you would have to reach out to parking if you are interested in longer term parking, because the temporary parking is just to get them in and get them out, and then for you move your, move your car so someone else can do the same thing. So uh, they parking will be citing that people are there past the, the the posted sign limit, which I think is about thirty minutes on there. So again, we're trying to get people in and out and moving um, with our limited temporary parking for moving. So. Um, if you have specific questions for move-in, your son or daughter or your student can email our office and Belinda will put the email in the chat there. So it would be just specifically, they're living in Warren, anything related to move-in or something like that. Always helpful to have the student email um, so, so we can look them up and find out their information. Um, remember, if you're asking the specific stuff, we can't necessarily respond to you because of FERPA. But if the student emails us, we can let them know and give them answers and they can copy you in the email and that sort of stuff. So that would be my my encouragement. Uh, yeah, back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Dana. And I just want to give a moment to both of you to share your final thoughts, maybe share anything that um, wasn't asked, but you think is important for families and parents to know. Um, whoever would like to kick it off, feel free. Oh, I muted first. That's the test there. Because uh, I, I want to give Sneeze the last word here. Um, I just want to re-emphasize what I spoke about at the beginning of really taking the initiative with your, your son or daughter to have a conversation about their new adulthood, um, your new way, how you're adjusting your parenting to fit that with them, um, how you're going to communicate with them, and knowing that it's an evolving uh, conversation that uh, you you may have had it one way when they lived in your house, and even though you're paying for their schooling or you might be paying for their schooling, um, they, they are independent in the university's eyes and can make their own choices on there. So this is really encouraging you to evolve your parenting um, relationship with your with your son or daughter that's going to work for you both. Um, and every relationship's different. So and it's going to look different day one, the first their first year versus the day they graduate, uh, your relationship with them is going to develop and change as well. So as much as you can push that along and be open to them and create some low expectations about how you're communicating, how often, um, we'll, we'll start to prime the pump of them um, feeling comfortable sharing things with you. So I'm excited to have them in here in a few days um, and see them grow into young adults and get an education and uh, do great things in the world. So 
I'll pass it on to Sinisa. Honestly, I would echo most of what Dana says. Um, they're slowly going to grow into becoming their own little independent adults. Um, and just to support them in that, just because they're becoming a little bit more independent doesn't mean that they will love you any less. Um, you know, the first thing my mom dropped me off, I was kind of like, okay, bye. And then I didn't call her for the next like 24 hours and she was really concerned and I was fine having fun. But um, over time, we kind of developed um, this relationship between us where she more so understood that um, I was really coming into my own time um, and I was figuring out like schedules that worked for me. Like if I wanted to go to sleep at 9 p.m. or 11 p.m. and that I would call her at least once a week on minimum. And if she didn't hear from me for one or two weeks, then she could start to like get a little bit more concerned or um, even just like small things like if there was some kind of emergency at home, like her knowing what good times to call me to notify me of those things would be um, and to know like maybe um, she's in class so maybe I'll wait a little bit longer to call her and to let her know that this this thing is going on at home um, so that I don't interrupt her day. Um, just small things like that, I think really can help your student feel more supportive or even just like remembering their friends' names when you talk about people. Um, if, you know, possibly if they don't want to go home for Thanksgiving. I know I actually did not go home for Thanksgiving my first year. Um, I went to one of my roommate's family's house for Thanksgiving. Um, being supportive of that because that is how they're forming their social connections and that's how they're becoming closer with the immediate campus community. Um, and it's also just important to remember that these are the people that will be around for their entire day. And this will start to become some of like their immediate urgent um, outreaches of support. Um, and to really help support them in forming those connections and to really encourage them. Um, there's lots of students here for them to meet. There's also other students who are excited. Um, if they're nervous or worried or anxious or concerned about not making friends, let them know that that's, that's probably not gonna happen. Um, and that there is a friend somewhere for them somewhere on campus. So just need to do a little bit of um, reach out to find those people. But there is someone here for everyone. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Dana and Sinisa. 